Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show. With me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 300, I reckon. Is it 300? I think it's somewhere along those lines. Coming at you live and direct. Hope you're well, hope you're feeling good. Amazing. Um, before we begin, as per usual, if you want to keep in touch with me and all of my um, good and amazing things, check me out on Instagram, which is instagram.com forward slash Agostino Zinger, all one word, and then twitter.com forward slash Agostino Zinger, all one word. Make sure you follow me on those platforms to be kept up to date with all the regular cultural news stuff that I see on the interwebs, or just generally to connect. And if you want to send me a message, feel free to do that too. And if it's your first time watching me on YouTube, of course, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment. That'll go a long way to making sure the show gets spread out. And if you listen via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five-star review while you're there. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Good. I'm feeling amazing. I've just uh, got back in from a long, well, not from a long rest session, but I had a, a semi-long session. I'm on to like week two of my How Higdon um, 5K plan, which I intend to, because obviously, you know, we're on lockdown at the moment, so there's no races I can go and do. And park runs are probably out of the question because they would probably involve more than two people. So what I aim to do is that I'm going to follow the How Higdon running uh, program. And then when it says I'm meant to race, I'll just do a 5K in the area that I live in just to you know make sure I've got something to sort of look for, something to aim for, a little kind of personal best thing. So now I'm doing, I'm on the second week of this program. Previously, I was doing the CrossFit Endurance program, which kind of um, prescribes that you would do less mileage in a week more tempo stuff more stuff involving form more stuff involving uh strength and conditioning training but how higdon's a kind of basic you know running a certain amount of miles uh a week split between days and then some uh some tempo stuff some repeats but mostly just running and getting out there and trying to get your cardiovascular endurance or capabilities up to where it needs to be um this is the program recommend you check it out if you're a runner and you want to get into running or um, you're looking for something new to do. I'm sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's the industry standard. A lot of people use it, but I don't know if you're into like the couch to fit sort of stuff or, or I don't know, but I've used this. It's on the website called howhigdon.com. It's a training plan. So I'm, I'm on the, they've got loads of training plans for, you know, if you're doing different sort of races, you've got 5k, 8k, 10k, you know, blah, 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 up until a full marathon. And then um, they split between the weeks, obviously here. And essentially I just did what I do. I did uh I did the four hundred meters. Yeah, I swapped the four hundred. I swapped the tempo run for ten two hundred meter runs, and then tomorrow I'm gonna do another three mile run, and then you know another five mile run on Sunday. So it should be pretty good. So you get quite a good split there. What I tend to do, I tend to sometimes swap the Tuesday run over to Monday. Cause I like to start my week with a run just to kind of you know break the monotony of the week being in and just to kind of get the week started in the best possible way and um, yeah it's, it feels pretty good I feel quite strong my legs are aching a little bit don't get me wrong but I've done a good job of making sure that I'm always using my little um, lacrosse ball to get all the little knots out of my feet as soon as I can and use that to massage some of my calves and my thigh muscles so that's been helping but generally you just need to just keep training more running more and that will usually kind of get you back to where you need to be so I recommend you check it out for sure but that's all I've been doing really I've not been doing that much else um, which has kind of allowed me to go outside a little bit more than probably others but yeah um, so far it feels as if everyone's kind of on the verge of breaking down which makes sense right it's the third week um, I think for the most part, most regular people, people who aren't me, will probably crack before then because, you know, you don't have the opportunity to go see your friends. Because I think that's probably why a lot of people are suffering. I think the family thing is a big deal, don't get me wrong, but I think the idea of just being social and just or just being out and about, I think people, some people might even miss the commute, you know. There's probably a, a majority, of, there's probably a small minority of people out there who just miss going on the central line in the morning, right, hopping on a crowded 25 bus. Or just you know maneuvering around Liverpool Street, or trying to get through the hordes of people that's an office circus. They probably just miss that busyness of a city because that's partly why you'd live. That's partly why people come to a city in the first place, right? It's because they want to be around the hustle and bustle, right? A city that never sleeps. Everything's always going on and shit. But yeah, for me, I've found it pretty cool, man. I've been I've been enjoying it. I think it's been a good way to kind of reset. I think sometimes you get presented with these opportunities to kind of um stop and make adjustments that you need for your life or just in general just to kind of reflect on what you've been what you're going to do um i equate it a little bit to like you know when you're like going out a lot and you have these back-to-back weekends and you're like getting smashed and you're coming back and you're feeling a bit foggy 
there comes a point where usually if you're not an addict if you're an addict you're just going to keep doing it but there comes a point usually if you're sensible where you sort of look at yourself in the mirror and you're like you know what do i want to continue being this person do i want to keep putting myself through this or should i kind of look at what i'm doing it happens when you're working i remember it used to happen to me quite often when i used to work in retail where you'd be like you'd be doing a um, you know a mundane task that you do pretty well most of the time and then some 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 reason you start fucking up you start coming in late you start just doing stuff you know half-hearted and then you start realizing you know what the problem isn't this place the place is perfectly fine nothing's changed it's that you've outgrown it right you've got to a point where you can't do anything more you can't offer your best level of care or service you also can't be a valuable team member so to basically help everybody else take yourself out of the equation and sometimes people don't really listen to those occasions they don't listen to that force that's telling you you need to look at what you're doing and recalibrate go out to the drawing board and make a change just you know they just par it off and then you end up being depressed you end up acting out you end up being grumpy you end up kind of taking out on customers who have nothing to do with it you know what i mean it just ends up being a little bit of a um, a little bit more a little bit of a spiral that ends up uh, affecting other people that shouldn't be affected by it um so i think this is a thing but again i think a lot of people are in a position where you can't necessarily be that um you can't necessarily be that philosophical because you know you have bills to pay you have kids to look after and i even thinking about it too like imagine people that have kids how they're how they are struggling just in terms of just doing homeschooling stuff right because i'm not sure if schools have given parents a curriculum to like um for their kids so they can do some work at home how much you know and it depends do the parents have the patience to do it how about if you have more than two kids even if you have one and they're i don't know they're freaking so they're some sort of like you know genius and they're in Mensa. what do you do then do you know what i mean like just because your genius doesn't mean your parents are going to be or do they have the capacity because there's something about teaching that's different from you know being a, a parent or a, an authority figure in someone's life it's a whole different skill set isn't it um so that is something that's really eye-opening and maybe for some parents who thought they could get away with homeschooling their kids maybe this is the reality check they need too that's actually a no, it's not as easy as they think it is going to be, but I'm um, I'm definitely got my uh, my sympathies go out to people that have kids that are in like you know secondary school and first year college and shit. Maybe they get given more assignments. I guess if you're in primary school, it's a bit more difficult um, to make that work. But yeah, imagine what that must be like. That must be hard. That must be really really hard. But anyway, what can you do? These are the things you have to deal with, and we all have our little challenges that we got to kind of uh, work with in some way, shape, or form. But yeah, but. Um, I've got loads of topics to talk about, loads of things to get through, some um, some quite interesting breaking news that broke over the, yeah, just in the last seven hours or so whilst I was in bed um, uh, regarding UFC, some other stuff in Garden Streetwear, so definitely keep an eye out on that one, and as per usual, if you want to support the show, definitely make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of it, and spread it and share it with your friends drinking a Bud Light because I'm in honor of Post Malone. These things are fucking nasty, by the way. There's only thing left in Tesco as earlier. Absolutely disgusting. It tastes like water. But I guess why people like drinking it. But anyway, let's go into the topic stuff that I want to talk about. List of options here. So number one, um, UFC 249 is postponed. Finally, the um, common sense has prevailed and Dana White's silly experiment that he essentially bought an island or hired an island to ship all his UFC fighters over to um, do the UFC 249 card has been cancelled. This is regard um, referring to Brett Okamoto's tweet, Okamoto, Okamoto, Okamoto. Earlier on today, he says, uh, "Breaking UFC 249 has been cancelled. All UFC two, all UFC events postponed indefinitely due to COVID-19." Dana White says he was ready to promote the fight, but things were taken out of his control. Much, much more to, on this to come. So first thing, like just reacting to that, I would say good, right? I was never in favor of having this fight in the first place, I think, or having a card in the first place. I think it was pretty stupid of them to think that that could happen. I understand the need to provide people with some sort of form of entertainment to get their mind off things. You know, stuff is a bit bleak out there. You turn on the news and it feels as if like, you know, this COVID-19 virus is going to seep through your windows and choke you whilst you're sleeping with your wife and kids. I understand that, but considering the fact that we haven't necessarily identified you know we haven't listed we haven't kind of figured out testing yet um there's all these weird anomalies popping up all over the place people that get it and then get it again um there's cases of people who are fairly you know fit and look after themselves who are getting and dying there's a case of people who aren't that fit getting there and recovering 
um, there's spikes and peaks all over the place. We're not in a place yet where we have any sort of processes or procedure that can allow such an event to take place, right? Even in hospitals where they have, you know, nurses and doctors and all that sort of stuff um, going through uh, contamination or going through what you call decontamination zones, putting on different pieces of equipment, throwing stuff away in the bin, double layering up on masks, putting a shield on, and they're still susceptible to it. So UFC fighters, so controlling that kind of environment is very risky. And if anything, considering the level of money that's involved, considering the fact that the UFC wants to be positioned in a way that they are regarded uh, similar or talked about in the same conversations as the NFL or the NBA in America, it just doesn't sit well because you know those leagues would never ever entertain this sort of thing, right? Not now anyway. You probably wait a little bit later down the line when things settle down a bit, then you can maybe pop out of the woodwork and say, hey, let's do this, let's do this because the key stakeholders will be more willing to risk their money and reputation to do it then because they know the returns are going to be amazing but right now the the amount of bad pr this could generate because again if it goes well you've got the ability to in a week's time i don't know if they could promote it well enough anyway because i don't know how much they spend usually in my experience of putting on parties and pubs and bars the later you put on a party the more you usually pay because you didn't plan it ahead of time you having to get things last minute people know you're desperate they, you always kind of pay over and above what you probably should have paid if you was planning it out properly. So imagine if the UFC decided they were going to do 249 on this fucking island anyway, right? Months ago before the outbreak kind of spread all over the globe and then it happened to come around now, it would probably wouldn't cost them that much, right? But doing it now last minute, trying to get broadcasting people to come down, or maybe because they've got an in-house team, it would make it a little bit easier. But just in general, it would have... All of those things in in due, right? All it takes is one person, just a, you know, some stage hand, some production assistant, no one even that big, just one person can sit within that kind of UFC universe to get it, and then suddenly things go goo goo gaga. Um, so that way I'm fine, and of course fighters as well for their health and safety in the long run, because it looks like you know fighters are like basketball players, they're like football players, their profession, their sport, their job of choice is fighting, so they love to fight, no problem, but the organization has to be able to step in and decide when it's safe to fight because those guys would fight on the street corner if it you know if someone was able to cut them a check and put people and have an audience to watch them they'd fight literally anywhere on the moon in the car park they don't give a shit because they are fighting same with the football players right if you got them to play in a village somewhere with no fans they'll do it because they love playing football but the ufc needs to be more responsible and kind of step in and kind of make that decision but they didn't so um it seems as if the powers that be people whether it's disney um, whether it's espn decide to step in and and be the wiser parent in this case and mma fighting kind of broke it down a little bit more here i'm going to get up here so we can see what's going on with the deal let me see if i can put it up here one second du, du, du. So this is from MMA fighting right here, right? Let's see if I can get it up on here. So MMA fighting, UFC 249 up and coming events postponed due to coronavirus pandemic. Dana White promises the fight and will proceed. So even though, you know, he's hit a stumbling block, he's still trying to go Barry on, you know, just bullishly trying to dig deep and do it. Now, the bullish attitude behind it, I'm not sure what it is because I remember reading something along the lines of, you know, ESPN or Disney has a contract in place with UFC that um, means that they, if they are able, no, that they have, they are, they have to hit a certain number of amount, they have to hit a certain number of events a year, in order to get the seven hundred fifty million whatever they've been promised in their contract. If they don't hit that amount of fights, however long it takes them, that deal is null and void. I'd assume so, right? Um, those guys don't play when it comes to those kind of contracts. So I understand the need to kind of get a fight on, but I just think. In terms of PR, in terms of perception, in terms of backlash, if they would have just waited a couple of weeks down the line when things maybe settled down a bit, when the peaks in certain places you know, dipped. I just read a report recently that supposedly the projection of death that was like going to be 100,000 has now been lowered to like 60, right? Which is obviously still not bad, but it's not 100. If you wanted to be a little bit um, capitalist, if you wanted to capitalize on that and take advantage of the kind of uh, brief a fleeting moment of victory that would be it but now whilst everyone is still confused and they're nervous to go shopping to put on an event like that it just doesn't make sense and also in terms of optics because again we, you can't necessarily blame ufc for this but i would assume in terms of optics 
the government wouldn't want a major sports organization like the UFC to put an event on because it would send the wrong message to the public. They'd be like, oh, that's on. That means I can go out with my friends, right? They would, of course, that correlation is a bit, it's a bit of a stretch. It's a bit weak, I know. But if, you're those, if you are sitting on that board and you're those people that get paid that kind of money, and you're making those kind of decisions you have to look at the you have to kind of pull away from it and look from it look at it from a bird's eye point of view and try and think of things five to ten steps forward ahead of time as opposed to what they end up doing we're just flying off the seat of his pants in it but what can you say anyway let's read the article here so this is from mma fighting it says the following um ufc 249 has been officially cancelled um the stunning reversal comes just days after you UFC president Dana White confirmed plans to move forward with events starting with the card plan from April 18th. The UFC has now decided to postpone all its upcoming shows with no timeline for when the up promotion will return to action, which is how it should have been from the beginning. They should have just done this from the start, said they were gonna postpone all the fights but not cancel them. Because I don't think anyone's cancelled anything really. Something some events have been postponed until next year, which is maybe a bit of a cancellation. But most things have been postponed because most contracts that you sign with the insurance companies, with the promotion companies, with the licensees, uh, whatever, they would have some sort of clause in it where if you cancelled it, you would have a penalty charge or something. We have to give back some sort of money. It, no, there's a lot of there's a lot on the line if you cancel an event. So I understand the need for to to be clear in the language and say no we haven't cancelled it we've postponed it if they did that from the beginning you would have no one would have complained especially when it comes to Khabib and Tony Ferguson we've waited to see that fight for ages no one would have complained waiting a couple of more weeks maybe a couple of more months to see them fight in their true glory um you know in a sanctioned event with maybe if not fans maybe some level of spectators there no one would have been um, against it whatsoever it continues um ufc broadcast partner esp initially reported the news so today we got a call from the highest level you can go at disney and the highest level espn white said in their video interview espn he said one thing that i said since we started our relationship and partnership with espn is that it's been an incredible one it's been an amazing partnership so again i'm not sure why he's saying this is it because he's trying to put it out there that he didn't make the call like he didn't say it's off he's trying to pass the blame to the ufc to the espn and disney or is it him trying to flex as if like the highest people in the office are the ones that called me and told me to like lay off either way it doesn't look good on you do you know what I mean like the adult had to step in and tell you the little kid to kind of come back inside and wash his hands and have his dinner or wash his or, or wash his hands or brush his teeth and go to bed so it continues here right um it's been being very good very very good to us and the powers that be there asked me to stand down and not to do this event next saturday the UFC initially postponed three events scheduled for March 21st and 28th and April 11th due to the initial outbreak, but they sneaked in that Brazil one. And if you remember the Brazil event that they sneaked in, which was behind closed doors, no one got tested. So they were trying to make it seem as if they were going to test everyone and we have the most healthiest roster of people. They were strong and fit, which is a really nonsense idea to assume that a virus isn't going to infect you because your fighters are strong. Even if they're strong, if, if they get it, because, you know, if you subscribe to the brain dead, like Brendan Shaw point of view, where he says, oh, you know, if you get it um, for, a, you know, for a week, you're not dead, innit? It's just a week that you're going to be laid up in the ICU. Okay, a week on the ICU, um, maybe close to getting a ventilator. And usually if, you, if you're on a ventilator, it seems like that's like your death note. So you take up space. So these fit um, supreme athletes who are in the prime of their life are going to be taking up space in beds, uh, it's hold up for a week because an event that what five percent of the population are going to watch maybe less than that continues um in the aftermath those cars are being cancelled white has an adamant about promoting cars starting with the ufc 249 in april just recently white said he secured the location for upcoming events with the tachi palace resort and casino in le mans california serving as a midship home for the promotion which weekly events let me see what this actually looks like i don't even see what it looks like um so this is the this is not the island this is just what is this the island or is this the place where they're going to do it yeah okay this is the place where we're going to do it because they they don't have um i don't know what the rules are there but i guess this is where they're going to have the actual event this palace they're probably going to be over in an arena in there or something all right cool there's no pictures of it on the inside we don't really see what's going on but this is what it's going to be anyway let's go to the article um why also revealed plans to secure a private island where he could hold events for international fighters unable to get into the states due to the current restriction so that event was going to be so that's why all the fighters are on the roster were based in north america and then i guess the international fights after the fact they'll have people flying out from their countries if they can to this private island 
and then fight and then go back again which is you know nutty to say the least of it if he wanted to go ball with it he could just like get his own plane in it and fly them in from wherever they are from a main point somewhere they all fly in let's say to london or i don't know berlin or whatever maybe and then they fly out to the us i don't know but it's still a crazy thing um for all events white promised to screen fighters and all other event attendees before and just before, prior to the event several people with knowledge of the promotion plans later to ma fighting that attendees were being sent at home at home coronavirus tests and expected another round of tests just prior to the event the problem like i said before the problem is these tests aren't accurate there's been some um some uh, discrepancies here and there with testing if you've been paying attention with the news and i'd imagine these tests aren't instant right they haven't i don't think they developed technology or they developed the processes just yet where you can have a test sort of like um like a diabetes one where you just prick your finger and you can instantly get a reading i don't think that exists just yet because if they did the governments will just buy a hold of them and send them to everybody around the country right just to make sure everyone's okay um especially with people cracking under the lockdown he says the fight anyway the continues here the fight card was scheduled to proceed with makeshift headliner of the UFC lightweight champion Khabib was ruled out of the fight with Tony Ferguson the fifth cancellation of the booking due to reported travel restriction um, from coronavirus in Michael Meadows place when Justin Gaethje who was set to fight Ferguson for the interim title um, on Wednesday, ex-champ Rosa Medunas was driven a rematch with Jessica Andrade. Her um, manager later said the withdrawal was of two deaths in Nama Nujas in Rosa's family from coronavirus. So imagine, they have all this flat coming at them from media. Most the UFC media has been a bit, you know, they've they've been they've been they've been a bit pussy with this, right? They haven't really spoken that much out of it because I guess for the most part, because you know. It's Dana White. If you speak out against him, he doesn't really change anything. He just gets even more bullish. His head gets more red and he just doubles down. The fans are a little bit in love with his kind of nonsense that he does and the, the kind of circle that follows him. But yesterday, you heard people like, you know, making disparaging comments against Rose, saying that she's a quitter, saying that she always flakes. And then now it transpires that the yeah, reason why she pulled out is because two members of her family died due to this virus going on. And the UFC knew this, right? They were aware of what happened. And they were still willing to go forward with the event. Like, imagine how irresponsible that is. And imagine someone else got ill at the event or catch the virus. And then this story came out. You know, it would just be a, a PR disaster. But again, someone like Dana just loves all the attention, negative or positive. But the reason this is so discerning is that if this was just like, you know, if they wanted to be the next pride, if they wanted to be an evolution of pride, right? And just a professional version of pride, let's say fair enough but from the beginning or from the moment they sold to the esp to espn the moment they went public they've made it known that they wanted to make ufc a legitimate quote-unquote sport um so much so that you know they get the best athletes from some of the best colleges around the world sorry around america for them as well we're around the world let's say um deciding that instead of going to play basketball or nfl where you know the contracts are lucrative they could maybe go to usc and you know and get all the glory there but number one, of course, the money and the monetary rewards, unless you're one of the top superstars, isn't that great? And then, of course, there's a danger of you fighting, you know, underneath the stewardship of someone like Dana White, who essentially just, you know, does what he wants to do on a whim, um, runs an organization like he's running, you know, a makeshift backyard wrestling organization. It's really, really insane, to be honest. Um, it says, anyway, now the entire card has been scrapped with the USD for spending all events. He says here. It's a quote from him, right? Um, while the organization was fully prepared to proceed with UFC 29, ESPN has requested the postponement of the event and subsequent bouts until further noticed. Jesus Christ. UFC looks forward to resuming the live full events event schedule soon. And he says, yeah, the end here says we will be the first sport back, which again, I don't understand this first. Who cares who's first or who's not? I think most sporting organizations are looking forward to putting on some event, right? I've heard football i plan on doing a kind of world cup sort of thing or olympic sort of idea where you fly all your athletes to one location or they play all their games behind closed doors in one location um during you know back to back during i don't know let's say a period of like eight to ten weeks and then you can kind of conclude the season and then from there you can kind of decide how you do next season um everyone's kind of people are exploring that kind of idea but again the idea is only plausible or is only kind of be possible if the rate of contamination or the death rate or whatever may be kind of plateaus a little bit i'd imagine so again just speaking from a layman i don't know nothing i'm just reading what i see on the internet but i'd imagine until the virus is kind of under some level of control um scheduling any kind of event now is just 
not the major thing on anyone's to do list really it's not i would imagine so anyway but what, what do i know but again i'm happy it's over happy it's all done um it says here at the end here fire island is real it's a real thing the infrastructure is being built right now and that's really going to happen and it will happen here on espn it's just a very it's frightening really you you'd think again i think to closing you'd think like because i think he mentioned you know having the pressure on his back about supporting his fighters and wanting to put money in their pocket now i'm under no illusion that there's probably people ringing up dana's phone hitting them up on text and sending messages and being like hey you know i've got family to feed my kids are in school blah 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 i've got mortgage to pay i get it but the reason why they're in a position primarily is because the payment system especially especially unless you're like you know connor nate uh john jones i don't know who else right you're not necessarily getting the big bucks everyone's on really really low in the, the the salary for average usc fighter is like what twenty thousand to thirty thousand dollars or something and then when you divide that between five people right whether it's his manager agent uh coaching nutritionist there's not much left especially now that they've kind of taken away the ability for fighters to wear any kind of sponsored gear in a ring right because a lot of fighters i think the brain Shaw mentioned it a lot of those fighters you say in that that era back in the day where you could put loads of logos in your shorts they said that made up for the lack of income they got from the organization right the ability to put you know um uh red bull on the back of your head or something that that was a way to kind of boost your income level especially if you're somebody just coming up so part of the reason why they're in this if this predicament is that Dana White is unwilling to pay his fighters a fair wage. Um, he's willing to kind of you know spend money allegedly on you know sex workers willy nilly or gamble away money in fucking Las Vegas. But when it comes to playing, he's paying his fighters who are risking life and limb, um, you know, in order to kind of reach a zenith of glory. He's willing to do that, and now suddenly he becomes the all caring all nurturing person that wants to look after fighters make sure they get paid well so it's like come on man decide what lane you want to be in and then for the fighters i don't really blame them because they want to get paid that's not to, that's nothing to do with them but in this current time uh, we haven't heard anything from usc about them providing the fighters any with any kind of allowance stipend any kind of support any kind of universal basic income sort of thing where they give them a thousand pound a month or something again it's not nothing because i'm sure some of those guys have got big families they've got mouths to feed they've got teams to look after i'm sure but at least something in their pocket yeah like 900 dollars, a thousand dollars a month like that'll go a long way as opposed to making them cut weight making them train making them go through you know mental preparation all this shit just for the fight to be pulled under the rug and again this was always in a car there was always 50 50 anyway right but then for for you to get this faint bit of hope and then suddenly you have to get pulled out from underneath you must be devastating especially for the people that actually didn't mind going because it's actually quite a cool idea right this idea that you've got this island that you're gonna do these fights on the gimmick is quite cool the idea kind of rings true right it reminds you of mortal kombat it's a fucking fantasy for mixed martial arts fans but not under these circumstances just not necessary um again it would be like a hollow victory to have this back on and become like the winner of it i don't really see the point of it but again glad it's over glad it's done um and now we can kind of move on to other things and hopefully um they find out they find a solution that works for the best of everyone going forward and again thoughts and feelings go out to rose number junior who's kind of having to you know um number one have to deal with all the trolls online saying that she's a quitter because she decided to pull out an event because someone in her family was ill and now because you know the you know the, the news has transpired because that's actually why she pulled out of it so thoughts and feelings go out to her as well and make sure you know you be nice on social and send us some nice support messages but yeah glad it's over man next on the list here we have weird nhs hats i'm a bit hmm, this is a one we don't to approach i understand the sentiment right I, I get why people are doing this sort of thing i know it's like you know you want to give support you want to make people feel good about the work that they're doing but there's something a bit self-righteous about this number one and there's also something incredibly corny too about this so this is a brand called blacksmith store um i'm assuming they're a uk brand and they've got these really cheesy corny nhs fundraiser caps so essentially it's a five panel cap distressed with a little strap back you know dad hat with a little strap on the back obviously of course it's got their brand written on the back of it it's all just so you know who did it and they've got this little illustration kind of like a faint i don't know and i'll say it's illustration right of the nhs logo it says here on the description nhs six panel or oh, six panel not five uh blacksmith cap 100 percent profit donated to the mask for heroes charity providing personal protective equipment to the frontline nhs workers available until 10th of 
10 a.m. Monday the 30th of April, made to order. I don't know, man. I've seen a lot of people doing this sort of like NHS merch to kind of support, you know, nurses and doctors. <sighs> I don't know. There's something a little bit, you know, self, uh, you know, self congratulatory about this. I don't know. Are we not doing enough with banging our pots and pans at 8 p.m.? Do we need to wear these ballpoint caps? And again, will this run its course once the epidemic is, or once the pandemic has slowed down? Will you be really pulling this out to go out and night out with your friends? And again, are there, are, are there no other ways to support your favorite charity or your favorite nurse and nurses or hospitals in that way? Can't you give direct to them? Was it not more beneficial to, you know, I've seen loads of footballers do a really cool thing where they send their local hospital, you know, like a whole bevy of Dominus pieces and shit, which I think is pretty cool, right? Because these guys are on their feet all day. They're working six days a week, 12 hour days. That's probably more helpful than giving money to a charity to provide them with PPE equipment. It's just like... <clears throat> Um, I don't know. I'm not. With, I'm not really with it. I think it's a little bit. I don't know. It's just a little bit me, you know. Especially with the logo on the back with their blacksmith text. It's just a bit like you know. It's a bit. It's a little bit tasteless. I'm not too sure. I'm really down for it. I've seen a lot of people do it. Um, again, maybe if you've got some sort of direct connection to this particular, maybe someone in your family is a nurse or something. Maybe that might make some sense. But you might need to tell that story, right? About oh, my mom, my aunt. She works 12 hour days and she's been doing this all her life or she's retired and she signed up again to make herself available to, in order to volunteer and shit. Fair enough. But just making the hat. I'm not down for it. But again, if you're into it, I'll link it. I'll link it in the show notes. It's blacksmiths, blacksmith, sorry, dash door dot com. Um, but I'll put in the show notes for you guys to check out if you want to see it. NHS hat. I think it comes in different colorways as well, doesn't it? I'm pretty sure, right? Um, let me see here. New arrivals. But I'm pretty sure it comes in different colorways as well, like a blue one. The logo itself is pretty cool. I like the illustration of the logo. That looks pretty nice. Um, but yeah, so it comes in uh, oh, it comes in six colorways. Jesus Christ, they made a lot of these, haven't they? So you got white, black on white. You got black on what's that? And a sage, black on brown, black on white. Sorry, black on beige, black on navy. And then white on black or white on navy too. So the colorways are pretty cool. The rest of the stuff they do is pretty nice. It reminds me of like a is it James Carborn, whoever his name is, right? So if you like that sort of way, then definitely check them out. But yeah, I'm not really down for it. But again, I'll link in the show notes so you guys can make your own decision on that one. Let's get that off the screen. Do, do, do. What else do we have here on the list? Um, we got this woman getting trolled hard. What is this about? Let's see this. I don't remember this video. Something about a woman getting trolled hard. Let's see what this is about. Please load. Let's see you. Let's see you. Okay, cool. So this is an article from the Financial Times, which I'm surprised about because you'd think they'd be a lot more discerning and kind of, you know, wouldn't necessarily get taken from mugs. But this tweet, primarily from this woman called Janine Gibson, and it's on the screen here. It says, in Berlin, they're stockpiling ketamine and coke and holding secret underground raves. And she's got a little quote from an article here, but let's read the entire thing because this is just bizarre. If you've been to Berlin, you know this isn't true whatsoever, right? But I don't know. Maybe she's just, she got sold a story by somebody. Or maybe it's, just, it's, a, it's a prank that's going to be revealed later on down the line. But this is obviously a fake fake news but let's just read it anyway so it says but um this is a headline from the financial times it says berlin's drug dealers adapt to life under coronavirus lockdown it says vendors face shifting landscape as supply routes close and users have change. and they've got a picture here of one of police officer holding a bag that looks full of cannabis or something and he's zipping up and pointing to evidence box so it follows following here it says from an appropriate social distance dave offers cheery advice to a customer uh, stocking up on ketamine as a lockdown in German's capital Berlin begins in by when you think a little bit more would be nice go to hell ahead go to the oh sorry when you so this quote says the following when you think a little bit more would be nice go to the hell ahead and have another bump he says indifferent to nearby police officers whatever feels good just go gently and it says the following around the world it is not just a legal business that they are being transformed by coronavirus pandemic from the corona specials to the personalized delivery services, drug dealers are hustling to keep business flowing. Suppliers are scrambling to find new routes as transport closes down and promoters are flouting the ban on groups by holding underground raids, which is true, isn't it? Like you'd imagine, like with most things, isn't it? drugs are like any kind of product, right? It needs to be, 
it needs to be moved from point A to point B, right? Sometimes point C. It goes from, you know, maybe the place where it's been cropped, it goes to a broker, a middleman, and then it goes to the, the, the actual location where then it gets divvied up to all the local dealers, wherever they may be, right? That's how usually a key would kind of get transported from the origin source to the broker. Then that broker does a deal with the people from their local regions, wherever they may be, and then they break it down and divide it amongst the people who deal with the territory. I don't know, wherever it may be. Maybe nowadays with Darknet, you're absolutely cut and you can go directly to the source, but usually that's how it works. So you'd, you'd imagine with people, especially now I've seen videos of police at borders, stopping people from going out, it would kind of stop the flow of those drugs coming in and out. So that would affect it in that way. But to suggest that somehow, you know, people are taking advantage of it is probably not true because I'd imagine, I don't know how people are, but I'd imagine if you're locked in at home, you're just sad and you don't want to, you know, you're in lockdown, you want to be with your friends. The last thing you want to do is get super wasted and super high. You probably want to keep it to some kind of sensible level. You don't want to go too crazy. Part of the reason why you do those recreational activities is because you're doing it with people and you're outside and you're having fun. Doing it on your own all the time probably is not the same thing. I would imagine. I don't know. Um, the article continues. It says the following here. Um, in Berlin, the city famed for its hedonistic nightlife and techno clubs at the Bergheim, dealers such as Dave are adapting to serve a large number of clubbers who find themselves stuck at home with little to do but get high. Again, who's Dave? Do you know anyone in Berlin called Dave? I've never heard of a Dave in Germany, personally. I think that's a bit of a lie. Um, social distancing, it says here, and restricting on movement has also spurred stockpiling with the prices of some drugs rising sharply. Okay, of course. It's a, it's a seller's market, I'm assuming. And here's a quote, it says, yeah, people are panicking and not just about the toilet paper, said Lucy, who deals cannabis to a private customer base, which probably makes more sense. I'm assuming people are going to smoke here and there, right? Call up your local um, coffee shop and get some bits and bobs. And it says the following again, um, right now I'm selling 500 grams a day. Jesus. Before I would normally sell about 100. And like all the dealers quoted in this article, she asked to be identified by her street name, which is what? Lucy. Dave and Lucy. Interesting, right? Jack, another private dealer, Dave, Lucy, and Jack. There's something dodgy about this article, I don't know. Another private dealer just received his biggest ever single order worth 1,500 euros. He said, preferences have not changed. He said, ketamine and anesthetics and anesthetics sold on the streets for its trance-inducing effects and speed are still top sellers. Many of his orders have doubled and, even, and some have even tripled in size, he says here. Um, what else is here? So dealers are tr dealers are dealers see trouble ahead. However, Lucy supply chain through Spain, badly hit by the pandemic, has been completely shut down. Okay, cool. Illicit trade experts say it's inevitable that the black market will take a temporary hit, but drug traffickers have an advantage on legitimate businesses. They are used to seeing distortions in supply chains caused by law enforcement, for example, or perhaps a particular airport detecting goods and cargo and having to adapt. Said Jason Ellick. Ellie, so a senior expert at the Global Initiative Against trans, trans, Transactional uh, Transnational sorry, Organized Crime, which is the what? G I T O C. Um, as restrictions on air travel are tightened and dealers say they are eyeing more routes by land and sea, hiding their product amid legally um, traded goods. One dealer in Lebanese, Hashish, said he expected his partners would try to smuggle the resin in among medical, medical supplies. <laughs> Jesus Christ. They'll find a way. They always do, which is true. I guess with this confusion, this would probably be the best time to... I'd probably be the worst time to smuggle people into different countries, right? I guess, yeah, right? People smuggling probably isn't ripe now. That business is probably taking a bit of a hit because people are being checked at the border for the deals and shit. But I guess transporting goods from A to B, especially legitimate, under the guise of B, them being legitimate, will probably work because everyone's trying to get their products moved from certain warehouses, um, shipped out to customers, um, or just try and keep that supply chain going so you're not having any bottlenecks anywhere, in it? Because those will add up and usually someone's paying and usually it will be you. And he continues here, it says, in Berlin, um, Goletzer Park, home to a notorious drug market, trade in illegal substances continues despite the lockdown, which is not true. If you look at any of the forums and stuff, a lot of people are just staying in, no one's going out. Um, during a recent visit by the Financial Times, police could be seen searching vans on one side of the park, 
while the other end crowds dealers many wearing face masks hawk their wares as usual which is you know is what it is we're afraid too man for ourselves and our families and we're worried about the borders prices going up said one dealer but for you i'll give you a special price <laughs> jesus christ experts say talks of prices rising could be taken in a pinch of salt it takes months for effects on supply to filter through to street level and some traffickers are just exploiting a crisis to gouge price which is true isn't it right i'd assume if someone blows up a plant somewhere in colombia you're not going to feel the effects immediately right because most of those bricks that have been transported are still running and still kind of circulating once that supply runs out and they can't re-up is when you start feeling the pinch that would be true so some people take advantage of it but i'd imagine a lot of people are just trying to get rid of it right because usually you get usually i'd imagine a lot of their business if i was a dealer would come from people spur the moment decided to get something on a friday on a saturday night it doesn't come for i don't i would imagine you don't get that much from your regular customers because they know how to pace themselves they might only buy a bit here and there but sometimes i'll spare the moment especially when it's sunny especially when it's a halloween or new year's eve and people just put in a large group order that will probably be where you make a lot of your money because you just make a lot you make the main chunk of your money in two or three transactions and then if anything else it's just like extra money on top i'd imagine i don't know this is the yeah, Butler's dealers who once sold cannabis for 10 euros per gram can now charge 15 to 30. Which I don't again, nothing is true. If you've been there, you'll know. Regardless, traffickers and analysts expect the coronavirus crisis will still have a lasting impact on the drug trade. From the development of new routes and partnerships to the potential rise of organizations that better exploit the crisis. It says here, um, Vanda Felber Brown, an illicit trade expert at the Brookings Institute, said she expects a push into automated transport. Just as it may be for legal businesses, says Amazon and others will be delivering groceries via drone to your doorstep. And in a similar way, we will see each reach a time when drug dealers are delivering your daily, weekly, or monthly hit via drone to your windowsill, which is nutty. Track the dealer predicted growing her use of dark web on the internet, which the drugs are posted for delivery. Da, da. I want to see the bit about them house parties. Where is it? 100 euros. Where? I'm trying to find a bit about 100 euros house parties but yeah again this article is a bit long i'm not gonna read the entire thing but i don't think it's true i think they just got had by a few people online um it just smacks of somebody trolling them but i think most of the people outside of berlin are hoping that there's somebody being rebellious out there and not obeying the laws but i think most people have realized how serious the issue is and just staying indoors plus you know a, a bit of enforced sobriety um seclu in isolation you know due you know as opposed to your heady weekends or heady weeks if you're in berlin it may be a good thing when you once this thing is over imagine what the raves are going to be like it's going to be absolutely insane isn't it so maybe the fact that they're just taking it easy is probably hard to believe but i think a lot of people are because you know they can't berlin's a place of warehouse parties and you know squat raves and all that sort of you know under proper underground culture stuff they're not going to put themselves in danger of ruining all that just because you know they want to get a quick client plus it's not going to be enjoyable because the moment anyone hears any kind of noise especially in a place where people don't usually fob you in usually you can get away with you know putting on a house party and banging the music for as long as you want and no one's going to really call the local council so why would you why would you kind of fuck the opportunity up just for the sake of going out for a couple of times it doesn't make any sort of sense so i don't really believe that to be honest let's move on Da, 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 da. Oh, electronic music and socialism. This is an article that got me a little bit riled up a little bit. I don't really agree with this, but I'm gonna read it anyway. It's from Mixmag. Um and it touches upon the idea of uh somehow being able to distribute wealth or income um that's generated from the dance music scene, whether it's from club gigs or whatever it may be, or live streaming events. To producers and DJs that are lower down the totem pole, right? The idea or the kind of perception is that most of the money is concentrated at the top, right? The main apex, the main point where all the big, let's say the top 20 RA DJs of our kind of place, production teams, labels, uh, uh, promotions, uh, live streaming platforms, they all kind of operate that top 10, 5%, and they kind of hoard most of the cash, quote unquote, if you, if you kind of, or if you believe. Um, this uh, presumption presented here by mix mag and most people on the scene and then everybody else is kind of fighting for scraps so they uh, this kind of article is uh kind of pushing this fee sharing model where you essentially take the you know 50 grand some big dj will get paid and somehow if they play a particular track from an an artist that artist is, is is entitled to get a portion of that 50 grand because obviously they're contributing to that event 
I didn't agree with it, but you know, that's the premise that is on there. So let's read the entire article and I can kind of go for some of my thoughts and feelings behind it. But I'm not really a fan of the whole um, socialism approach to electronic music. Um, it, it's not really necessary, really, considering that the reason why it's like this at the moment is because the model is broken and there's some parts and there's some accountability need to be taken from the players in it who have got it this way in order to change things as opposed to going after the big DJs who are earning the money that you know they're rightfully earned or that you know the market dictates that they get let's fix the system first so that we don't have a we don't have a platform where you know this person's getting 50 grand and then the person underneath is getting 10 the disparity is too much especially when for the most part especially if you've been in this I've been in this I've been doing it for 10 years um, I know from my own self, like being honest, like there's not really much separating a lot of the bigger DJs to the ones just below them. There's not much. Of course, there's not separating your bar person to like somebody that plays at a festival, plays at like, plays at big clubs, cool. But from the the top ones, from the top twenty RA voted to maybe the ones from twenty one under to probably fifty, there's not much separating them in terms of ability wise, in terms of talent, in terms of in terms of uh, taste in terms of reading a room, in terms of maybe appeal, there's not much separating them. I'm assuming the top ones are, let's say like a Ricardo Villalobos, if you get him to play in a fucking, in a shed somewhere in the middle of Forest Gate, that thing's going to get sold out. There's people that move tickets and that perform on a high level, but mostly everyone's sort of playing on an even playing field. But this is the article I did from Mix Mike. It says the following, uh, headline, should the free sharing model be enforced in dance music? Enforced as well, I'm not liking that term. That's a little bit, um, or fair, or authoritarian, really, and uh, we don't want that. So, so following, um, it's becoming increasingly impossible for producers to earn a sustainable income from making music. And while the events industry is struck currently on hold, DJ fees have been scaling to eye watering heights in recent years. Now, firstly, I don't agree with that statement. I think increasingly impossible is something that could apply for all digital, all kind of creative endeavors on the internet, right? Because the internet democratizes everything, right? You can now, because of the internet, I can effectively put out an EP, put out an album, uh, put out a video edit, put out a live stream, put out a mix that could essentially, if I put out enough of them and I do enough work, I could potentially be on the same um, lineup as a Seth Troxler, right? Just because of the internet. Back in the day, if I wanted to do that, I'd have to press a dub plate, I'd have to buy the equipment, right? I'd have to uh, buy a really expensive computer, really expensive gear, sometimes analog gear. I'd have to learn an instrument. I'd have to have contacts at the record stores. But now I could just submit my stuff. I can even just upload it on SoundCloud. I don't even submit it. Maybe have people uh, talk about it on social. It gets picked up by a label who contacts me via Instagram, and then suddenly now I'm the next big thing. So that affects everybody. It's not just to do with production, not just to do with electronic music scene. Everyone's kind of feeling that digital squeeze. But again, I still think the cream rides to the top because there's more competition out there. You have to raise your game. You have to come with something different. You have to come with something unique. Um, you can't just, you know, phone it in like people did maybe in the past when it was a little bit more easier to do or a little bit more harder to do. It made that less people were doing it. Sorry. So it continues here. So DJing, of course, is a skill that should be valued. Anyone who has ever watched their favorite DJ set uh, shred so I can attest to this however the current global royalty system largely unfit for purpose should be looking at a radical way new ways of ensuring electronic music makers are compensated far fairly for their time and craft I agree with that one uh, it says yeah dance music sphere has come to mirror societies in which it resides and the wealth divide between the world's highest paid DJs and the global underground community is a gaping chasm that continues to widen and now I don't think that's a bad thing I don't think underground DJs should try and get paid like someone that's playing at, let's say, I don't know, Awakenings or somebody that's playing at, I don't know what big festivals are. They shouldn't be thinking that because the whole reason why you're underground is because you have the ability to play for a, probably a little bit more of a discerning crowd. The, the spaces are more interesting. You probably play more regularly, I would assume, right? Because those events only happen, those kind of um, Awakenings and those other things only happen during a particular time of the season. But if you're an underground DJ who's fairly good and has a good following, you could be playing all year round all over the world right you have maybe you don't pick up 10 grand a set but you might pick up your 200 euros 500 euros every single weekend doing you know essentially pressing pause pressing cue and play for tracks that you didn't make is a pretty decent salary of course compared to david getter it isn't fair enough but do you want to be david getter do you want to be playing that kind of music do you want to be on a private plane um do you want to have the pressures of uh, trying to live up to the expectations of a commercial audience. Do you want all that? That is not the same level of kind of, um, that's not the same level of work needed really, isn't it? So the, the, the pay is a bit, is 
that is probably appropriate to the level that you're working at because there's some there's some commitments that come with being David Getter that probably a lot of underground DJs wouldn't want to do anyway, regardless of how much they were getting paid. So I don't really see that correlation there. And it says, it says the following. In 2019, the chain smokers took more than 46 million. Marshmallow racked up a juicy 40 million. And David Getter lined his pockets with a modest 18 million. These are all the mainstream DJs with few or, f- or no ties to DIY dance music communities pushing electronic music forward. But as we discussed last year, what happens when Apex Twin plays a track by a left field club artist in his set? Should we share some of its essential performance fee with the artists? That is a stupid correlation. So sometimes it's just Apex Twin is anything like David Guetta or Marshmallow or Chainsmokers is nutty. The Apex Twin is nothing like that. Apex Twin is actually coming from the underground. It's probably one of the few artists that have been able to pop in the mainstream, maintain some kind of level of integrity, dignity, not sell out which is you know it's a bad term anyway but he hasn't sold out in the conventional terms and been able to take his um his brand of underground electronic dance music to the mainstream without being without compromising too he does it on his own terms right sometimes it's been rumored that he's not even him playing on the fucking stage at most of the occasion he's him playing fucking white noise for an hour it's him just having these amazing lighting effects and you know putting out random eps and stuff he recorded 10 years ago like he's just doing things at a really high level he's really representing us underground the music fans in the right way to suggest that he that him playing a track by an underground artist is exploitation or that whatever is ridiculous because part of the reason why an underground artist part of the reason why that would be a good thing is because you're an underground artist and some mainstream guy who comes from your scene is playing your stuff is good how how comfortable would you be if you're an underground music producer and David Guetta played your stuff anyway? Would you like that? You probably wouldn't. You'd end up like most one-hit wonder people, right? Who, especially in the dance music scene, I, I think of, um, who, who can I think of? I think of maybe Danny Days, maybe is a good example. Somebody who made a track that happened to blow but didn't represent anything that they actually are into. That's sometimes they can get caught in, right? Uh, Major and Coles is something like that, right? What they say isn't something that she probably wanted to do her entire career, but it happened to pop, and now suddenly you're having to make a, a different alias so you can play other kind of music. So people aren't expecting that same kind of techie house, deep house sort of feel. It's a two-edged sword, isn't it? Like, and I don't necessarily think it's a fair comparison to compare Apex Twin to David Guetta. They're different levels. They're, di- they're different groups, different levels. It's just a whole different thing. But anyway, let's continue. It says, although the vast majority of DJs and artists unanimously agree that producers should receive a certain amount if the major artist plays a track, the practicalities of fee sharing are messy and unrealistic. DJs, because it's a quote, DJs making high four to low six digits, Apex Twin, etc. Again with Apex Twin, man, Jesus Christ. He doesn't get any respect from Mix Mag, innit? And imagine the people they promote on here and they give him Apex Twin stick. Really? Like, come on. While playing the music to others, it's highly problematic even though for many folks these are the only types of gigs that they will help them eat it's odd to bind it's odd to bind to be and says avant-garde pop artist laf la lafa wadna lafa wadna i don't know how you pronounce it um i like the idea behind it but it's just really where do you enforce it offers berlin based dj dj zero uh fee sharing is fair though it's a fair fall and it would be nice but how many rich people are sharing their resources not enough cool but also should they? I don't think so. And again, let's 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 step away and kind of treat dance music as a a utopian sort of like ideal of how you know the wider public should kind of deal with things. Yeah, we have different clubs, different cl- niches, different communities, different subcultures for different things. You don't necessarily get what you get at Fabric in Fold, you don't necessarily get what you get at Bergheim at About Blank, right? They serve different audiences, they provide different things, and they do a hell of a job at it. So, they sh- and again, they pay accordingly, judged by what kind of gates they get in, blah, 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 whatever it may be. I think the problem is not that these producers aren't getting the opportunity to get any sort of fees from the bigger DJs who are playing the music. The problem is that most of these mid-level, low-level clubs haven't got especially the ones outside of berlin for the most part outside of germany don't have a system or don't have a residency program that allows local artists up and coming producers to play on a weekly basis so they can build their own name right so they can make their own you know income on a on a kind of consistent basis get their name out so that when that big person does play a record someone's got a reference of where you play and where you're at because most of the times these big people who are playing these records from underground people 
they're playing records from people that don't, haven't played a set in a club before right and then they suddenly get propped because that tune blew up they get booked to play a gig somewhere and they fall flat on their face because they haven't played regularly enough and then suddenly now the gigs dry up because the good thing about electronic music is that if you do make a track that blows usually or that pops in the mainstream or that gets some sort of attention usually people give you the opportunity to play you come in oh sick you're that guy that made that song come play at my club i, I think you've got good taste because you made that song that's the assumption that you have which makes sense isn't it if somebody makes a good paint if somebody paints an amazing canvas or paints an amazing landscape an amazing still life an amazing portrait you would assume they are able to maybe replicate that right in some way shape or form so if you're a producer and you make a really good track, uh, it's, fair to me, it's fair of me to assume that maybe you might be good at selecting tunes. Now they get there and because they haven't been able to play, because again, playing at home, you know, even if you're live streaming it is one thing, but being able to play consistently in a bar, in a club, especially somewhere where you've got a guaranteed audience who are able and willing to accept the stuff that you're playing, you've got a captive audience, is really important for people coming up, especially the low to mid-level people. They need that platform. So that they have the practice so that if the big clubs start calling and start wanting you to play because your track was played by an apex twin you have the ability to kind of build on that platform as opposed to this person plays your song they go to your soundcloud and they see that you've last uploaded something a year ago because you got this disillusioned and you just got a normal job so the problem is in it's in it's, in, it's attached to the clubs and the infrastructure around it because they're so desperate to get Ricardo Villalobos to play every single weekend, your local producer, your person up and coming can't play those sets, those peak hour events, or they're always doing a warm up, or they're always doing the clothes when no one, everyone's left. You need to get those people playing in your mid to low level clubs in order to supplement or in order to support the stuff that's going on in the big leagues. You can't expect those big people to kind of pass the money down to people who what is the what is the use of that even right if i'm fee sharing and i'm at the top what, what's the benefit of this what's going to happen it's not doing anything it's still not allowing them to make more music it's not allowing them to play out to public it's not allowing them to break re broadcast their message louder enough it just doesn't make any sense it's sort of similar to like imagine if somebody i don't know you're a young influencer and you've got a brand and somebody what what is somebody was it i don't know what what do you fee share with people online on social media when they promote something you're just thankful that they credited you. Like if someone uses a picture, oh, just credit me and tag me in a thing so people can follow me on my Instagram. You're not expecting to get a profit share out of the clicks that they got on their YouTube video or AdSense. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, it continues here. It says, um, for London's Paris, who makes music as well as DJing, it says the issue is also a complicated one. Ruminating on the idea of fee sharing or of, playing, of paying a fee of global database tracks, he hints at a potential of a DJ eat will eat itself type of situation. He says artists could just end up playing a set of all their own tunes, which is true, which means that they would just end up playing themselves. So I'm not sure how realistic this uh, idea is, which is it's just not realistic. Like, I don't, like, it, it's, it would be, it's a, uh, it would be a fantic, fanciful idea, right? In ideal situation, you would like that. But again, I just don't see how that works. I just don't see how it works. I think it's more likely that you'd get, it's more, there's more, um, there's more chance for the scene to grow and for people to develop as artists if they're able to have a platform to play more often, not to have to hand out some of the bigger people up top. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, read the article yourself. It's a whole article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I think I've got my point across. You know where I stand on this for the most part. But the title of this is called Should a Free Sharing Model Be Enforced in Dance Music? Check it out. It's by a writer called April Claire Welsh. Again, it's well written. She gets her point across well, but I just fundamentally don't agree with it. Um, I think it's the same thing why I don't agree with the idea of having 50-50 uh, splits on lineups in terms of gender. I, I want to see more equal representation on lineups, but I don't want to see people just given slots because they happen to be of a certain, you know, uh, color, creed, uh, gender. It doesn't make any sense, right? You want people to be on there by merit. And the problem isn't the lineup, it's the problem is the promoters who are putting the lineup together. They're not putting lineups together. They're not taking chances. They want to do the safe option and book, you know, five versions of Mesa Plex in every kind of event. I love the guy, but come on, right? Instead of going out and actually plucking people out from the scene who are playing people who are up and coming and getting them on the, on the lineup to be more effective because i don't think people have a, a problem if it's an all-male lineup as long as there's people that are up and coming that you've heard on the you've heard on a grapevine that you've kind of discovered through a subreddit you discovered through a forum or a facebook group that's more interesting as opposed to seeing the same person play at seven events seven times in a row and it's usually the same sort of music nothing really changes that's not what you want to see. The way that the scene grows is by the promoters taking chances. But if they just say, I want to split the lineup 50-50, what will end up happening? They just end up 
picking this the same issue happens you, you just end up pay, picking from the top 10 female DJs in the scene you put them on there and then still the girls that are like position 20 downwards are still going to complain because they haven't got the spots to play because those same girls get picked again and again so you're just repeating the same um mistakes and the same missteps that happen you know usually now i, I just i don't know again i hopefully there's another model for it but i just think it's the, the industry needs to take a hard look at itself especially the promoters especially the event managers especially people that book people or the agents or whatever they may be they need to look a little bit more deeper and try things out of the box and allow them to do that because again I, I don't necessarily see the point of booking a big person to go play a lion lamb for instance right like that kind of pub right in old street it's a pub that got what maximum 250 capacity people in there why would you need to pick someone that's been pitching an ra to play there pick somebody that's up and coming to play there weekly to pay there once every once what, the third saturday of the month every single month right that will so they can build a audience they can build a way of playing they can you know i don't know cultivate a little scene a little community so that every every third friday you know when to go you know when to hang out as opposed to booking some big dj who doesn't really care about it takes a booking fee doesn't retweet or share the fucking flyer and then you end up an event that you're paying out of pocket for just so you can say you got ex pay pictures to play there it doesn't make any sense but anyway you recommend you check out the article yourself and see what they're saying but 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 what else we have on here um oh, da, 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 da. what else we talk about let's go one more thing here before i leave oh yeah fear of god and zegna this is a pretty cool capsule collection that they just revealed actually which i think looks amazing um first of all i think jerry lorenzo's had a bit of a hard time with fear of god in it like but i'm glad he's stuck with i'm glad he's stuck with his vision and has along the way refined it i think that's probably something that you could really give him credit for as opposed to maybe like an emiri who sort of essentially just copied um the work of Hadis the main from uh saint laurent and just recycled it and just ran it through a little la uh filter and recycled that look again and again and again but at least with jerry lorenzo you felt like in the beginning he obviously had influences um from jerry lorenzo with fear of god had influences from rick owens to Hyder Aikerman, to maybe yoji to maybe some undercover stuff maybe some vetmans early vetmans well he has some influences there but over time he has refined it he has got he's kind of refined his image he's got a bit singular he's got hyper laser focus for the most part and really kind of uh uh provided a different sort of look when it comes to men's world on the market at the moment it's quite evident you can spot a pierce which is probably the the kind of um the zenith of what any designer wants right without a logo without any crazy branding you can spot a fear of god piece out on the especially on the street if you see someone wearing it from a mile off you know exactly what the cut looks like you know how the shoulders drape you know how the sleeves um, hang you know about the drawstrings you know about the cut on the pants you know about the shape of the t-shirt like all those things are something you can point out just by you know looking at someone walking down the street which i think is definitely something you wouldn't have envisioned in the beginning when he was starting a brand but he's got this amazing opportunity to collab with zegna um, a luxury Italian fashion house that for the most part you know they're famous for making you know um, crocodile skin crocodile skin outfits that cost like 10 grand right they're like an amazingly opulent luxury brand and he's been able to collab with them and bring their kind of expertise their level of craftsmanship their level of quality and put it through a streetwear sort of like casual fashion lens without it being too basic and without it being too kind of mundane just really nicely done stuff and i think these two images first of all epitomize it right on the right you've got uh, a five panel ballpoint cap with zegna and um, a fear of god written on it and which i think is a great piece because most of these luxury brands i remember the story of when phoebe Philo was at celine and one of the pieces that sold a lot at the Celine store was just the Celine logo t-shirt but it was never available in the racks you had to go and ask the sales system to kind of pluck it out from the back room they were very res re resistant this is maybe prior to the whole fashion prior to the whole like street style thing right street style now has turned into a sort of like a logo festival where everyone wants a logo or a brand or some sort of thing and i think a lot of designers are kind of leaning into it and designing stuff with like you know crazy text on the back or distinctive stripes or patterns but back in the day people didn't usually do that and maybe i guess that kind of level of designer phoebe filo right 
it's probably thinks it's a cheap way out to kind of just put your logo on a t-shirt because you know the brand has some kind of you know relevance or appeal to it so the t-shirt is elevated immediately just by putting your name on it um but again it might cheaper the brand you might want people to kind of buy into the mainline stuff but i like the idea of kind of taking and saying now taking whatever they do with their factories their manufacturing and just applying it to a classic classic menswear item a boy point cap black with white text that it can be worn with many different kind of outfits right it works really well very versatile and the shape's amazing kind of white text on a black board on a black sorry ball point hat and of course on the left here you've got this amazing blazer jacket with a great turtleneck and perfect blue acid wash jeans so just really very very nicely done um so let's look at the entire collection and see what they have here let's make it full screen so again image one you've got this sort of blazer with a turtleneck on the right here tucked into some nice blue jeans you've got the hat that i mentioned um here on the right on the left hand side you've got it looks like a leather bomber jacket or a leather flight jacket and then on the um, and then next to it too you've got a hoodie which i'm sure that there's a lot of time attention with this hoodie i like the fact that there's no drawstrings it's just like some holes on it i'm not sure if they're buttons but the the t-shirt maybe it's terry cloth maybe it's cashmere but it looks very opulent very luxurious and then you've got these high-waisted um sort of pleated pants that look great too and then of course you've got these look at the creasing on these pants on these jeans sorry they look really good they remind me of like a pair of apcs that you might pick up right so um those look really well done and then you've got a nice gray uh knit jumper there with again with a leather piece and a nice trench coat it looks like so some really key essential wardrobes wardrobe pieces for you know for men so loads of nice pieces there you've got a nice little short sleeve shirt here i'm not sure what the name of that of that shirt is on the inside but i like the addition of these these kind of um, trousers with the waistband up right so the waistband come in just above your belly button i'm not sure what that style is called it reminds me of like the stuff that um you'd see maybe a male ballerina wearing right so that kind of vibe is very interesting let's go again put it on that's full screen uh, so you've got that then you've got this obviously great color this sort of like sandy which is i'd, I'd, I'd say it's maybe a trademark fear of god colorway this sort of like sand brown um overcoat sort of thing great length you know something you might see jerry lorenzo wear in street style pieces the branding on the pants is very interesting they always have these sort of tag just here on the front of the front seam here just above the crotch which is a really interesting place to put something but again um the jumper looks really nice nice and ribbed jumper it looks like it's been turned inside out doesn't it a little bit like inside fluffy and you've got the zegna and fear of god branding there so everything's either embroidered or screen printed but just very um kind of uh lightly done all photograph all photographed by tony tommy ton too so maybe a bit full circle there maybe tommy ton was the first person to take pictures of, of jerry you never know but i like the idea behind it and of course you've got the trench coat here another sort of long i don't know if it's called a trench coat or just a just a long coat or long double-breasted coat that maybe comes across you've got a nice addition of a pinstripe suit here you've got again that uh bomber jacket instead of in leather you've got the in the jersey material with some nice ribbing here and a nice pair of pants again model here i love the braids it's really cool in there imagine that you've got again the turtleneck and the blazer jacket again some really nice pieces some trigger shoes look really cool too some stuff has got the backless where you can kind of slip them on like slippers but yeah very very nicely done man i love the photography and the casting is really good again a classic t-shirt here with the branding on the left of the left chest pocket you've got a really nice addition here of this uh woven belt here leather belt kind of tied in since here at the front very well done Oof, those jeans are so good that cut and look at the boots as well the desert boots are nice kind of a uh a little twist on the classic same on wyatt and instead of a instead of a light light uh light color on the sole they've gone for like a dark brown sole which is really interesting to see that. Hmm, I wonder how that works. I wonder if it's going to be a Revy zip. And of course, you've got the jeans here as well without without a hem. They're sort of just like a raw edges on them at the bottom. But the cut on them looks fantastic, isn't it? especially with that shirt. It's a brilliant look. So again, these are staples that you can wear all year round, really. You can mix them with any amount of outfits. It's never going to go old. And then again, this um, jacket print sort of like a coat as well. It looks amazing. We've got addition again with that button shirt there. 
very very nicely done man like i'm sure most of it will be a lot of money it's not going to be cheap but this is beautiful and represents straight runs and fear of god's vision really well you know he looks like he's been able to go into Zegna and just do what he does with his brand and use their expertise some of their you know people that work within the pattern cutting team because that leather jacket is beautiful and i don't know what kind of leather that is this cowhide or whatever but that nice, looks gorgeous so it's a nice chunky zip as well then again you've got the navy overcoat you've got the dish of this great piece here also very interesting isn't it it's it's essentially like a wow really nice with a hat as well it's essentially like a half button quarter button top with kind of an elongated sleeve it looks like it's been pulled up maybe it can get pulled down a little bit with some nice chunky buttons as well i love the details on it man. really really well they're done Again, overcoat with the pinstripe trousers and a model hugging Jerry at the end. Thanking him for the fucking crazy bits that he's going to get emailed or faxed or FedEx to him after the shoot's been done. But quick interview with Jerry Lorenzo talking about it. it says here from Hype, he said, What are your thoughts on this collaboration? Um, both in theory and in the clothing itself, he says, I think it's collaboration between Zegna and Fear of God is a match made in heaven. It's refreshing to see a Fear of God evolve into something much more sartorial but still retaining Jerry's imprint. Refined and elegant are two words to best describe this collection. The moment I felt the garments during fittings, I could see Alessandro's uncanny ability to modernize Italian sartorial craftsmanship and merge seamlessly with Jerry's carefree effortless. I've said to be honest, speaking to you here. Oh, Tommy Ton. Cool. He said, How do you opinion the collection change seeing it first time? He said, Elevated. It's the best word that came to mind upon seeing it first time. Nothing can beat when you have two great minds together, but it's just the resources that the House of Zegna can bring to the table, which is very true, isn't it? I think that's what now you're seeing that some of these, especially when you see a Cold War from the beginning to where it is now, you're now, I think Kanye's rants are being vindicated and the idea that without the production, without the manufacturing, without these big houses supporting you, it's very difficult to get yourself to look like the stuff that you're kind of sat alongside with on the rails. You need to have the access to these production teams, to these manufacturing plants in order to have your stuff look like that. It's just a level, it's just a question of contacts. And I'm assuming some of these people have exclusivity deals. They're only allowed to deal with certain amounts, certain brands, certain houses, certain certain conglomerates or port or corporations or holding companies so once you have that investment and you have the contacts to kind of open doors for you suddenly your product is elevated like a cold war the cold war stuff now looks fucking phenomenal compared to how it looked like in the beginning because he didn't have the he didn't have obviously the resources the funds but mostly the access so um it says elevated um nothing can beat when two months come together he said you know first time from the yarns source for the knitwear to the precision of the tailoring it's not buttoned up as maybe some might be concerned working with italian house especially as in tailoring it's just easy and transformative in a moment you put the clothes on awesome what did you want to showcase your photograph it says i wanted to focus on the craft and details primarily i wanted to say uh this was minimalist but it's very thought out and considered i know jerry is very hands-on with every tuck pleat or any gesture of touch it's important that extra set of eyes sees and tries to capture that i'm always grateful for jerry to entrust me to capture the collection in a different perspective but he gives me freedom to capture what i'm feeling this is a beautiful collection and it was hard to stop taking for us because there were so many moments of beauty yeah definitely you can definitely feel that you can definitely feel the love the appreciation between one you know one group i guess zegna too would appreciate what jerry's doing with fear of god because he's been able to provide uh his kind of modern take on americana luxury streetwear in that kind of sense but with a tailoring aesthetic behind it and zegna have been able to kind of lead the way from a kind of luxury high luxury point of view of menswear kind of that european uh point of view in menswear and in streetwear sort of way in their own kind of way don't get me wrong so for them coming together it's probably they're learning a lot from him that they can apply to their runway collection so don't be surprised to see a lot of um the notes that they've taken from this apply to the runway collection they present next season and also don't be surprised to see a lot of the stuff that jerry's learned from his time at zegna apply to his stuff that he's going to do in the other seasons too so i think this is a match made in heaven i'm not usually down for the whole fashion and streetwear mixes but sometimes there can be some great synergy behind the two and i think this is a good example of it um any details in an upcoming day we've got to take a look at the, the this will release in september 2020 so in zegna boutique and select stores worldwide so yeah definitely take a look out for that it's a amazing collection i think it looks very very nice or very very nice it's gorgeous actually it looks sublime that hat is going to be everywhere in it oh yeah this is the hat that drake wore in it yeah so definitely see that everywhere i think he wore the blue one i'm not sure if that's a sample it's like a blue colorway with like a white text so expect to see that everywhere but 
my my pick so far of course is the overcoat especially the overcoat um in the sort of navy colorway and then of course the jeans and the desert boots those are my those are my picks definitely 100 my picks and of course the suit will be you know that'll be a best way to get you know this is probably the only exact suit i'll be able to afford uh, in the immediate future so that's definitely one of it but that overcoat there on slide number what's that slide number 17 and the jeans and desert boot combo on there on slide number 12 are my two favorites but definitely recommend you check it out man some beautiful pieces there from fear of god and zegna from hype beast anyway that's an hour of me rambling thanks so much for tuning into excellent english episode number 300 as per usual if you're watching this show via youtube and you like what you're seeing smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment if you're listening via the podcast app give me a five star review share with your friends and all that good stuff and if you want to see more stuff regarding myself check out all my links at my website down below excellentzinger.com be able to find my instagram follow me on there follow me on twitter send me an email check out my blog all that stuff is on there but until next time i'll see you guys again very very soon peace and blessings take care bye